Oftentimes you'll hear people say that cloud computing is what they call a disruptive technology. Now that sounds kind of harsh and what they mean by a disruptive technology is that just like a pebble thrown into a pond, when this hits the surface of the water, it causes this ripple effect to go out in all directions around it. Cloud computing is seen as a disruptive technology largely in part to two factors. First of all is the widespread proliferation and dependence that we have on technology across so many of the world's industries. Quite literally, almost everyone is looking at what this technology can do for them. And the second factor is that cloud computing is perceived as being something new. And anytime there's something new around, it seems to represent change, which is something that organizations are both interested in and drawn to. But at the same time, there's also this fear and concern that this newness is something they won't be able to take advantage of or could pose a threat. Now, I'll admit there are some cool new things about the cloud, but in all honesty, it's really still built on top of three traditional tried and true technologies. And that is virtualization, automation, and wide area networking. Let's spend a few minutes talking about this first one on here, virtualization. To help us through the conversation ahead, a quick look at some vocabulary terms. Feel free to pause and come back and review this at any time. In order to explain how virtualization works, it's critical that we understand the concept of abstraction first. And to help explain the example of abstraction, imagine that you went out to a restaurant. So there you are sitting there and your stomach's growling away and you're feeling kind of hungry. In the kitchen, you have a chef. Let me put a little chef's hat on there like that. Boop, boop, boop. Now, you're not the only person in the restaurant. There's a bunch of other people sitting at their own tables all around the room. Could you imagine the chaos that would ensue if everybody was allowed to talk directly to the chef? It stands to reason that the chef would fail to get anybody's orders right, might not be able to cook any food at all, and the restaurant would dissolve into chaos. Of course, this is not the way it works at all. Everybody in the restaurant is given a little menu to order off of, which provides an interface for them to ask questions and understand what the restaurant's offerings are. And when you've made your selection, you don't tell the chef directly yourself. Instead, you tell a waiter who is there to take your order, Similarly, the other guests in the restaurant can place their order with the waiter, and the waiter can then go back there and drop off all of the orders collectively together with the chef. In the end, the abstraction is happening by keeping the people who are preparing the food and providing the service abstracted from all of the diners in the restaurant. This improves the experience of everyone involved. In the world of information technology, you're going to find abstraction at work just about every single time that we see software and hardware working together. Imagine for a moment that you were going to go and save an image onto your desktop on your computer. Now, desktop is a pretty simple concept. Most every operating system out there supports something like this. It's important to recognize here that desktop is a logical reference, and it doesn't really tell us about the physical devices that exist in the background. Under the hood, there is assuredly some sort of a storage drive, maybe an SSD solid state disk of some sort. That is the actual physical device. Now, the problem here is that the physical devices, they need to talk binary. So that means that if you want to write information onto the little sectors that are on there, you're going to need to be able to write that all in binary. Fortunately for us, the operating system has created a file system on top of this hard drive. This is where the notion of like my C drive or any of those like mount points or directories that you might have in a Linux file system come from. These are logical references that point to some part of or the entirety of some other physical device. In the end, the good news is Bart can think about saving images to the desktop. I don't have to think about writing binary because the operating system and the file system that it created provided that necessary abstraction for me. Abstraction for the win! All right, so let's go a little bit farther here. Just a moment ago, you heard me talking about how a file system was a logical representation of some sort of physical disk in the background. Getting a little more technical, in the world of networking, there is such a thing called a virtual local area network. That is a logical type of construct that lives on top of physical switches and ports. And to close this up, in my restaurant analogy, the menu was that logical interface that I worked with, which represented the actual physical chefs cooking the food in the background. Similarly, if we were talking to a web page, that would provide a similar type of abstraction against all of the servers, infrastructure, networks, storage devices, etc., etc., that are running in the background to serve that content and make that interaction possible. 
Now, if you've watched my other cloud computing lessons, I introduced this concept of a system and we got very detailed about what a system is basically comprised of. So on the top, the software was comprised of the applications in the operating system. And on the bottom, we said that these were all of the compute resources that make up the hardware. One of the big problems that we had with this basic concept of a system is that if I needed to move it from one part of the data center to another, or maybe even from one data center to another data center, it meant that I had to pick up the whole stinking system, put it into a truck, and drive it all the way over there, and then reinstall the thing physically. It was all physical. This is before the era of what we call server virtualization. Easily, the most important piece that makes server virtualization possible is a special type of operating system that we call a hypervisor. And this is absolutely one of my favorite terms in all of technology. And the hypervisor installs directly on top of the hardware, interfacing uh, directly with the compute resources that we were just talking about. Once we have our hypervisor installed on our hardware, we can create what are called virtual machines. And a virtual machine basically looks and functions just like a regular system would as far as the software is concerned. There is a virtual CPU that they see, there's virtualized RAM, there's virtual storage that they're going to have access to, and there are virtual network interfaces. And so as this went on, we were able to take applications and run them on top of these virtual machines without them having any idea that they weren't working directly with hardware. Once we had virtual machines in our tool bag, things got really interesting really fast because now we could start virtualizing all of the other systems and servers in our environment to create VMs that were properly sized for the workloads that they were running on. And in many situations, this meant that organizations could go take those physical servers that used to run all of this software and turn them off, and more importantly, stop maintaining them. This basic process is often referred to as server consolidation. And it certainly has a number of big power and cost and managerial improvement wins that go along with it. But this isn't the end of the virtualization story because currently we're still just running on this one physical server. Most organizations have more than one hypervisor. In fact, many of them have many, many virtual hosts running hypervisors, and they have them all connected together using some sort of a network. Now we have a really interesting concept called portability. Our virtual machines don't have to stay on the one same physical server anymore. If this hypervisor starts having a bad day, I can use the network to move these virtual machines over to the other physical hosts that I have in my environment, thereby allowing those workloads to survive the loss of the original physical server. This portability is wildly powerful because maybe some of the hosts are out there in Oregon and some of the hosts are in uh, Virginia. It just depends on where your physical locations are. So in the end, we've described cloud computing almost perfectly through the processes of abstraction, consolidation, and then also portability, cloud computing vendors can make all of this available as a service so that customers can just come and run their virtual machines on top of all of these tools they've built. These same mechanisms make it possible for Bart to run his little virtual machine here. A different customer, Keith, could be running his virtual machines on this spot. And then Sri's team of developers over here might be using these other virtual machine slots on the same physical server. And thanks to server virtualization, their workloads don't interact. Be sure to check out my other cloud computing lessons where we talk about the important role that automation plays in creating cloud computing services. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.